I can't, can't see the chat. <laughs> Michael, can you see my screen? I can see it, yes. And I'm also getting a lot of positive responses in the chat here. Okay. All right, so I cannot see the chat and I would very much like for this to be interactive. So please turn on your mic. And if not, I would ask the TAs to keep an eye on the chat and interrupt me at any time because these screen shares are quite a lonely experience. I'm sure you've had one last semester presenting a project or whatever, but I have no idea if anyone is listening, if anyone can hear me, if, there, if anyone is interested. So just a okay. plea to you to keep this interactive. I'll let you know if I notice anything in the chat. All right. Feel free to interrupt me yourself as well, to correct me, to interject. Uh, because the notebooks that I'm about to present, you can just go through them yourself. You don't actually need me to go through them. So this would make much more sense if you have something specific, something to share, something to ask. And with that, let's just get started. Um, if you go to your Moodle, you all have the option to start a Jupyter Notebook in the cloud. What I will do in this uh, session is to do it locally, which you can also do if you have Docker. If you don't have Docker, you can install it and do it after the session. I already have Docker on my machine. I suppose you can see my terminal. The image is already hosted on Docker Hub, so you can actually pull it by running docker pull vebus slash ml dash lab dash class. This will assume the latest tag. And since I already have that image locally, it doesn't actually do anything. So I will start this Jupyter notebook locally by running docker run dash dash rm for docker to clean up after me. I will bind port 8888 in the container to the one um, on my machine because Jupyter is a web application which runs in the browser so I need access to a specific port. I will also bind mount, um, mount type bind mount the local my current directory so that my changes are saved on my computer. And the target inside the container I believe is home slash Jovian, which is also the name of the user. And if you didn't know, Jovian is the adjective of the word Jupiter, as in the planet, the Jovian moons, for example. Just some useless knowledge. And that should be it. If I press enter, it will start my notebook. It will give me the address to enter. And if you opened the Jupyter Notebook the server in your Moodle, you should all now be, um, be welcomed by this screen, which is basically just the file explorer to a specific directory on my uh, local machine. You can see text files. This is the specific Docker file that we ran. We can share it with you if you like, but it's just the same image that's hosted on our Docker hub. Um, if at any time you close this um, window, you can get back to it from, from, any, from any window by clicking on the Jupyter icon here. Um, so what can we do? If we Press new, we'll do the, the notebook in a second. We can, for example, create a text file. 
and what that will allow you to do, for example, is to create Python scripts, which are basically just test files. Um, let's see, let's define a silly function, define hello, that doesn't take any arguments, that just prints the obligatory hello world. And let's define a main function. that just calls hello. I can save that by running control S and I can go back to the home screen and I can see that this is actually created. What I can also do is open a terminal. This is just a bash terminal. I can run commands like who am I, the user Jovian. I can run ls to see what uh, scripts there are. I can run a Python a script by calling Python on it, and we can see the script that we just wrote. Um, we can enter the Python interpreter, which if you haven't experimented with it yet, you just enter Python on your local machine and you just get this REPL interpreter that just takes commands one at a time. Now, something interesting about the Jupyter Notebook is that it used to be called or it, it, it is the child of something that used to be is, the iPython. Is, is, sorry, is it just me or is this really hard to see because it's so compressed? Is it? Sorry about that. For me, it's it's rather well readable. A little yeah, pixel. Maybe but just it zoom a bit in so it's, the compression isn't. There we go. Is this better? Yes, that's better. All right. Um, so in, if you Google some blog posts, so you see it referred to as the IPython notebook as opposed to the Jupyter notebook. IPython is just the old um, project and you can still run IPython. And in fact, the Python kernel that powers the Jupyter notebook that we will use later in the, in the web browser, like the interactive thing, is just using this thing here in the background. And you can run the same thing you can run one plus one blah and you can have the same experience so this is still this still exists in the background but this is not what we're interested in so we'll just run control d to exit and what we want to look at now are the two notebooks that you will find linked in the on the course website uh i'm i'm assuming that the viol people will have their own page but you can yeah, feel free to use the looks uh, exactly the same. Yeah, but feel free to use the, the Leipzig page. You're more than welcome to do that. Oh, we'll let's start with the Jupyter one. Let's copy the link address of this, and we'll just run wget paste, and this will just download the notebook into our local directory. I'll click on the Jupyter notebook again, and I can see now that we have a. Jupyter notebook that we can um, actually I'll zoom in, zoom out a tiny bit. Right, so just a few words. Um, as this won't be um, an, uh, um, like an entire tutorial that will teach you everything that you need to know about Python, but rather the goal is to have you learn the concepts that you need to know as the course progresses. So we will introduce concepts as we see fit depending on what the exercise will be. But we do provide a few pointers and a few hints and just an impression of what the language is. And to do that, we use, among others, these resources, which you can, which are open source, which you can go and walk through on your own. Um, the Python tutorial later will mostly be um, based on this. Um, Tutorial by Jake Vanderplas. And my personal recommendation, if you want to learn Python for data science, would be to, 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 to go and check out this book by the creators of the Pandas package, Wes McKinney. Uh, an excellent book. So let's just start with a few obligatory Wikipedia excerpts. Um, just a few interesting things about the project. Uh, the name Jupiter is just an approximate acronym, which comes from the three basic um, main kernels that used to be supported by 
the project, which are Julia, Python, and R. The Jupyter theme is also a, 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 um, a wink to Galilei's notebooks, who discovered the moons of Jupiter, which is also why the user, the, the default user is Jovian, the, the adjective that comes from Jupiter. Now, this particular notebook is running with a Python backend, specifically the IPython thing we saw in the terminal a minute ago. But in general, this interface is agnostic to the kernel. So you can set, switch up kernels. You can even have kernels for compiled languages, which I would never recommend you to use. It's just to show you that it is possible. Now, you will notice that a lot of science communication, even from the big conferences like NeurIPS or um, I'm blanking on conferences right now, will communicate results as Jupyter Notebooks. GitHub will render Jupyter Notebooks. So this is the de facto way to, to communicate findings, tutorials. So this tutorial here is to show you the kind of things you can do with the notebook. If you would like to read more about that branch of presenting results, I would recommend you look up literate programming, which is an old concept by Donald Knuth, who will, you will you might have heard of in the context of computer science. And the, the, the basic paradigm is to move away from just writing a program that does something, but rather write something that does something that is at, at the end of the point, but also in a way that fits the way you're thinking about it, the way you want to present it. So you wouldn't use these in production, but small parenthesis, Netflix actually uses these in production. So we do know that Netflix has a lot of um, they did have a lot of notebooks in production. I'm not sure if this is still the case, but yeah. So let's get started. You, you might have noticed that there are cells in the Jupyter interface. This is a cell. This is also a cell. There are two kinds of cells. There's something called Markdown, which is the thing that we're looking at right here. And if I double click on it, you can see that this is just rich text that is um, being rendered in a way that is, quote, nice to look at. And if I press Shift Enter, this will render as well. And there are code cells, which is where we want to run Python, which is the point of what we're doing here. Now, to, to really get um, become a power user, you, you have, well, you don't have to, you don't have to do anything, but I would strongly recommend you to take a few of these commands and incorporate them in your workflow because it, it, it really is useful when you're in the middle of coding your uh, concept learning algorithm and you don't have to reach for the mouse and right click and do whatever. You can just use these commands. And to do that, I have to tell you that there are two modes to access the Jupyter Notebook. There is edit mode and there is command mode. Right now, we're in edit mode. I can just press up and down and the, 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 the cells are highlighted. Now command mode binds the keyboard to the notebook like a level commands. And you can see that if you press enter on a cell, Some useful commands that I haven't included here are, for example, B. If you press B when you're highlighted on a cell, you create a cell under it. You can enter content, content here. If you press A when you're highlighting a cell, it adds a cell over it. Pressing enter will put me inside the cell. And to execute, I actually have to press shift enter. Now doing that will execute the highlighted cell and then highlight the cell below it. If you want to execute and stay in the cell, which is useful when you're looking at markdown, you would go control enter so that so it has to stay in the cell. Um, other useful things you can, if you're in the cell, so in edit mode, you can go control slash to comment something and control slash to talk about that again. And that works for Markdown as well. 
and Jupyter just knows what sort of comment structure to use there. Um, very useful in Python is indentation because we don't use columns, but we use spaces to mark um, differences in expressions. If you select something and you go control square bracket to the right, you indent it in a Python appropriate way. And if you press control and left bracket, you indent it back again. Um, just have a look at these. You can press H to see all the shortcuts. You have to be in command mode to do that. Or you can press P and actually search for the command. So delete cells is DD one after the other. So let me be just while in command mode, so not inside the cell, go DD, and this will delete this, DD, and this will delete that, and we can move on to the next section, which is running bash commands. If you prefix the code in a cell with an exclamation mark, you can run, run bash commands, which are the commands that you'd be running in a bash terminal, with the same terminal that we were earlier. So if I run exclamation, who am I? I'm the user Jovian. My current working directory is my home directory, and if I run ls, I can see all the files that are my current directory. Now what's cool about that is that you can use Python variables inside these bash commands. And to do that, you either have to use this dollar sign or these curly braces. So if I set a to be the, the, the root directory, I can run ls a, and if I just select everything on this line, run control slash, we'll comment this out, and uncomment this, use it the same way, you'll see that it's the same thing. What's even cooler is that you can assign the return of these bash variables to, to uh, these bash commands to variables. So I can do something like set A to the root directory and B to the return of the ls command, and I can print B and it's uh, what is this actually? It's just a Python list. Oh, it's a specific IPython specific list. But since Python uses something called duct typing, you can probably just run list B and have that turn into a normal Python list. Now, this is something that's very common in Python. I didn't actually know that this would work. I had a feeling that it would work and it works. And this is something you'll encounter very often. And it's, it's, it's the usual way of doing things in Python. If you have an inkling that something might work, it probably will. Now you can use this exclamation bash command uh, thing to install packages. So in your online uh, Jupyter notebook, if there is a specific package that you're interested in that doesn't exist in your and in, in, in the installation that we provide, you can just run pip install by adding a, an exclamation point in front of it. Now numpy is already included, so that won't actually do anything. So just get the output. Okay, the next important thing in Jupyter Notebooks are what, what are called magics. And magics are special commands that are prefixed, with, prefixed either with a percent sign for what is called a line magic or a double percent sign for what is called a cell magic. And these commands will enable some behavior that either affect the line, which you put this percent sign in front of, or the entire cell that you put this command in. And it has to be the first thing in the cell. It can't even be a command. Now, to see what sorts of commands you can use, there's a magic. And that magic is ls magic. Um, um, Christopher, quickly, there was someone asking in the chat to have a question. Yeah. So to go back to magics, there's a magic that lists all the magics, and that's percent ls magic. Um, this is interesting. I'm not sure what this is, but 
okay, this seems, okay, this will be a good learning experience. This seems to tell me that auto magic is on, so the percent prefix is not needed for line magics. And this seems to be referring to this thing here, auto magic. And for everything in Jupyter Notebook, whether it's related to Jupyter itself or to Python, you can introspect using a, a question mark. Just since I'm not really sure what auto magic is, is, I'll just run shift enter on that and it will bring up the pager, this thing here that you see in the bottom. And it will tell me what this auto magic business is. And it just seems to be the fact that I, for line magics, I don't have to include the percent sign, which I'm not a fan of. So I will run the auto magic magic and it will turn that off. So like I said, you can add a question mark to introspect things and to bring up contextual help. Something I find myself using a lot is the time line magic, which just gives you how long, both in CPU time and wall time, something runs. And you'll find soon that when you start running complex code that doesn't work too well, you will often have to like take a deeper look to see what's up. Now, if you run time it, that's the same thing, but instead of running it once, it will run it as many times as, as it thinks is necessary to provide a good estimate of how long it's gonna take. We'll see those in a second. Um, rerun, we'll run the Python code profiler and the load X magic is to load an IPython ex extension by its module name, and that includes magics. And the fact that you can define your own magic commands by following this link or install some via pip means that you can use this load X magic to load additional magic. So I'll just install this uh, memory profiler, which is not included. It installs it. I can load it, and if I press A to insert a cell and run LS magic, we can see that these new memory related mem it and m prun are available. Mem it is just the equivalent of time it, but in the memory word, and m prun is a memory profiler. So let's you don't have to understand the code, the actual Python code. I'll just add percent time magic in front of it, and it will tell me that it runs in 349 microseconds. If I add time it, you'll see the star here, and you'll also see the, the hourglass favicon that tells me that the kernel, that the Python kernel is busy and I won't be able to do anything until it gives me back control of the notebook. So this tells me that it's not 349 milliseconds, it's rather 18 milliseconds. And it had to run it for 100,000 times to be able to estimate that. Now a cell magic will apply the magic to everything in the cell. So it's the same as before, but you don't have to worry about adding time in front of every line. And it's the same for time it as a cell magic, as you can see, because it's, again, the two percent signs. And if I run that, it will also run it a few more number of times. And it will tell me that it takes six milliseconds, not nine. And again, this is something that's extremely useful for your algorithms when you start developing them to have a look at what is actually going wrong. Now the Python profiler, is also run by a magic. And this is more useful when you have a complicated function that you need to keep track of, not just uh, one expression, but you get the idea. Um, the memory profiler, also a line magic for the expression. It will tell you how much memory was used. Now the memory profiler itself, for some reason, won't let you profile functions that are defined inside the notebook. So to use the notebook to define a function that is saved as a Python script, we can use the right file magic. 
and we it's a cell magic so we'll add it to our cell i will write this function here to a script that doesn't yet exist a script text file that doesn't exist and it tells me that it ran it i can of course run our trusty ls to see that it has indeed created it i can cat it i can tab autocomplete and it will show me my um i will import that function and see that it does work and i can run i can now run the memory profiler on that function again it shows up in this pager display in the bottom which you can pop up pop out or remove at any time other magics include running Perl, if that's your jam. <laughs> I worked very hard on that joke. <laughs> you can run bash scripts. You can run basic native SVG. And you can just try the rest of the magics. Let's now move on to more uh, a more aesthetic and rich media. Or, um, something to note is that when you add multiple lines to a cell, the last cell is the one displayed. And what's being done implicitly is that the display function that's already available in your workspace is, is called on the last thing. So if I run display three, the display function actually displays a number. Um, actually, I can show you an additional piece of person uh, of, of um, functionality if i if i don't want to run the question mark command i can run um what was it was it shift tab no it wasn't shift tab it was yeah shift tab and it will bring up the signature or the help of a function in such a con contextual thing so you don't have the pager i tend to do this because the pager personally annoys me and you can see that the display is an ipython function that displays python objects in general so ipython or the jupyter notebook provides an additional method for all python objects to be displayed we can display integers but we can later see that we can display data frames and things like that you can suppress this implicit displaying by adding a semicolon you will find this useful in future sessions when we use matplotlib because it will tend to display literal objects as well as display the, your graph. So you will need a way to stop the notebook from uh, from actually running this display by running the semicolon. Now, sometimes display does weird things. If I remove the semicolon and I display, so implicitly display this list, you'll see that it's quite annoying because it displayed for some reason every element on one list. So for lists, I would encourage you to use the print native Python command explicitly. Again, we can uh, run the question mark to read the description and the signature of the function, to see examples, to even see ways in which you can um, have your Python object. So if you have a specific class, you can define a display method so that you display it in Jupyter and it displays in a certain way, for example, in HTML or in a PNG or whatever. Now, something that I always do in a Jupyter notebook, and it's beyond me why it's not um, like a default option, is to make the page wider. You can change the width here. I tend to set it to 90 and this, <clears throat> excuse me, this actually um, showcases the display module of Jupyter. And this specific module is an HTML module, a function rather. And the display function knows how to display HTML. Now we're just hacking it here to just define style. We're not actually displaying HTML, but we're forcing 
the actual rendered HTML to um, to just occupy more of the screen. Now, if I scroll back up to the, where was it? Here, to the display module, you'll see that there are actually, I'll zoom in, 23 class that the display classes, that, it just, that the display function knows how to display. It can display audio, code. So if you want to, present code in a non-executable way and that you don't want to run the risk of executing it by accident. You can actually format something to look like code that is not executable. Um, let us showcase a few of these examples here. This is rather markdown. So I'm in command mode now. If I press enter to go into edit mode, you'll see that normal markdown, the same thing that you use for your readme files on GitHub is, is usable here. So you can define tables that are rendered in this way. You can also include it, whatever HTML you want. And it doesn't even have to look pretty, but it does render to a proper table. Now what you can also do is display equations and should you wish to provide answers to the exercises in Jupyter, you can very much do that. You can just go to the MathJax website. They do provide a very intuitive tutorial and you can learn how to both render an equation like that or just feature it in line as part of a sentence. You can also combine this to present an algorithm like the one Benno presented at the end of his slide, which is also good to communicate science. Um, you can play sound. I won't actually, play. I'm not sure you can even hear that. Yeah, you can try that. Very faintly, but yes. Oh, you can. Okay, so if you would like to hear your data frame rather than see its statistics, you can do that. You can embed YouTube videos like this one here. I'm not sure how to autoplay videos though because I wanted to rickroll everyone and I couldn't figure out how to make it autoplay. So I just included this um, Jupyter tutorial for the people at TensorFlow. You can embed photos that you can find on the web. I've embedded one that I find particularly useful, which is the scikit-learn cheat sheet, different areas that are covered by the many algorithms. Now you won't necessarily use scikit-learn because the point is to enable you to, to build scikit-learn, I suppose, by creating the algorithms from first principles, but in terms of how things should be organized or how to how to how to how to manage your functions this would be a good cheat sheet in general and in the future when you start using scikit learn instead of writing your own things you can also embed an arbitrary iframe I've included the pandas cheat sheet. We'll see pandas next week. We won't be able to cover it now, but also something to keep in mind. Now you can, you can programmatically um, generate these iframes. So if I, I could, for example, create a string URL and set that to, the website and so I'll generate like that. I can also do things like pandas equals pandas and use f string notation. 
So this is basically substituting the variable pandas for its actual value. And since I put this F thing here, you can look up Python F strings to learn more about how these work. Okay, so that's it for the um, Jupyter part. There are many more things that I didn't cover that you can do with Jupyter. You can restart your kernel. A lot of times you'll run something that will just break your notebook and you can just interrupt it, just start it and clear all the outputs if you want to start over. And yeah, I would recommend you checking out these resources, one of them, all of them, to see more details. And we can, I suppose, take questions now and move on to the Python part of the tutorial. There is one question in the chat um, related to the exercise. Do we need to take a part of HTML code and work on it, or we need to fetch data from the website? Um, I assume you are referring to the exercise 6b where you are supposed to implement these uh, feature functions, is that right? Yeah, so um, you could really do either to test your functions, but what you have to produce as an answer to this exercise is only the functions itself. Are you, um, of course it makes sense to collect some HTML to test your functions on, but how you do that is completely up to you. So you could do it the way that I showed last week by just writing a string with some simple HTML code in it in your notebook, or you could uh, make it more complicated and download some actual websites from the internet if that is more your cup of tea. Either is fine. But what we want in your submission is only the function itself or the functions. I also have one more thing. Uh, the clearing and starting over that Chris just showed you, please do that before you submit your Jupyter notebook, because otherwise you might submit a notebook which runs on your computer because you have everything in memory and then we started from scratch and nothing works at all. Yeah, yeah, this is important actually. Can you show this again, Chris? How to run everything from scratch? Yes, I could restart and run all and it will ask me if I really want to do that and I'll say yes and it will just go sequentially cell by cell from top to bottom and you can even see the pager being changed because some of the commands are interrogation marks that are asking for help and once it reaches this last cell of the notebook which it hasn't yet it will execute it and it will regain. I suppose it's still benchmarking at the top. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah. yeah. And a new lesson, if you do something and you realize, oh no, this is too much, you can interrupt the kernel right here and it will keep you in your session, but it will just stop the kernel. You can also press control, uh, control C to do that. So control C will stop the cell that is currently running and interrupt the kernel and tell and basically send a keyboard interrupt to, to the Python, to the IPython kernel. Yeah, and you may notice that something that worked before suddenly stopped working because you changed something in between and didn't update the code properly. Yep, and I can say from personal experience that ha that happens too often. I, uh, I, I tried to be, um, organized and how you do things because this sort of computing in an, in an interpreted setting makes it very easy to just keep trying things and building on new cells and then adding things on top of the cell. And then if you restart it, like Yannick said, it'll just break and nothing will run. So pay attention to the order of execution when you're submitting. Okay, then I will Yes, I would say that fine. Um, for this first exercise, it is not required. If you are already familiar with NLDK and you want to implement some feature that depends on NLP, then of course you can use it, yeah. 
I'm not sure if NLTK is. Uh, it's not. So okay. you would have okay. to run pip install NLTK like we showed you. Yeah. They'll be you advised that. The, uh, oh, yeah. We, 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 we can do update the image to include it. Yeah, we'll do that. Um, okay, so one last thing. Since every notebook has its own kernel, it's usually good practice to when you close it to to kill the kernel. So I'll click close and halt, and you'll see here that there is no kernel anymore. Nothing is running the Python part. So it will still render things, but it's no longer attached to a kernel. You'll see that there are no notebooks running. There are still the terminals running that I started earlier. I can shut those down. If the notebook was still running, I could have hit shut down on that, but it's not since I explicitly told it to halt.